Okay. <laughs> Professional. <laughs> so I'm sitting here with Dan Strangerd. Um, and yeah, I, I, for a very long time, I wanted to know your story and how you came to the issue of genital autonomy and circumcision. And so I was wondering if you could just share with us the, uh, your journey. Well, this goes back to my earliest memories. Uh, as a three or four year old, I knew I did not look like any of the other little boys, including my two older brothers. I had complications from my circumcision, but I didn't even know that I had been circumcised. And uh, so my father was intact and I looked like him, but no boys that I saw were intact. I didn't know the words intact, I didn't know the word circumcision, I didn't know the word force, and I didn't know anything. I just knew that I didn't look like any other little boy. When I was about six, my father took me to a pediatrician for a school physical. Now, my father was a doctor. He could have done this himself. But um, he took me to a pediatrician who didn't say anything to me. But uh, I'm up on the table, just wearing my underpants. And the doctor immediately pulls down my underpants, immediately grabs my penis, and yanks my foreskin back which hurt like hell. I didn't even know I had a glance. I had so totally covered I was as a child. I was absolutely shocked. I was mortified. This person had hurt me and nothing was said to me. When I was almost eight years old, we went and lived in Taiwan for a year. My father was an exchange professor from the University of Chicago Medical School to a medical school in Taipei. And not everyone back in 1960, 61 had indoor plumbing. So I saw people using the gutters and every Chinese male had a foreskin. So trying to feel better about myself, <laughs> I thought, hmm, okay, my parents can speak Chinese and I have a Chinese penis, therefore I must be a little bit Chinese. <laughs> and I felt much better about my body. And of course, after a year in Taiwan, coming back to the United States, uh, again, I was the only boy with a foreskin. The swim classes in my day at school were in the nude, so I know that nobody else had a foreskin in my class. It was very strange growing up that way. And I'm not trying to say that somebody should be circumcised so they look like everybody else if everybody else in that society is circumcised. I'm saying nobody said anything to me. I had no idea what the difference was. Uh, I still didn't know anything about being cut or anything like that. I, well into my 20s, I didn't think I had ever been cut. So this has always been an issue for me. And finally I got to a point uh, 20 years ago that I had to start saying something about it. And now I won't shut up. <laughs> when my oldest nephew was born, I didn't say anything. I didn't protect him. And 35 years ago, my other nephew was born and I didn't protect him. Fortunately, that 35 year old has a two year old in tech son now. So I feel a lot better about that. But, and he's, my nephew is very opposed to circumcision. But when you don't say something, in America, the child gets cut. If you say something, you might save the kid. You might not, but you might save the kid. And I have to say something. This is just very, very important to me. You have, you have to say something. I'm not a religious person. I don't believe in sin so much, but um, I don't try and do bad things to other people. And yet, I made a conscious decision not to say anything. And that is my sin. That is something I can't forgive myself for. So I have to talk. I decided I needed to go and talk to the Chicago Norm and No Group. 
Um, and so I went to a meeting and I found that there were people who didn't think I was crazy <laughs> and uh, understood that, you know, you shouldn't be cutting children. And in, then in early 1999, Marilyn Milos came to Chicago for a one day national meeting because the AAP came out with a new policy statement in 99 and the AAP headquarters is in Chicago. So I met a whole bunch of intactivists, Marilyn and Dan Bollinger and uh, I think uh, George Denniston and uh, maybe even Mark Reese, I think he was there, I'm not sure. But uh, I met a whole bunch of intactivists in Chicago and then I had to be involved in, in things. So I started going to David Wilson's protest in Washington, D.C. And I started going to AAP and ACOG protests. And uh, that gave me eventually the impetus to go protest at the University of Chicago. Because that's where I live. That's where I was. Uh, so once I had uh, protested with the others, I was very nervous about protesting on my own, but uh, I decided, you know, I believed in what I was doing. And uh, the University of Chicago was not being responsive to my asking them nicely and politely and you know, stuff. So I decided I will go out and I will talk to anybody who will talk to me. And I will talk to them publicly on the street in front of the hospital, across from the president's office. So how long did your protest outside of the University of Chicago hospitals last? It eventually was 10 and a half years. Wow. Almost every weekday, when I was in town, when the weather was reasonable, and I will confess that in the last few years, the weather in wintertime did not seem very reasonable. <laughs> so I talked to literally thousands and thousands of people. And I know it's impossible to condense 10 years of activism into like a, a sound bite, but I'm, I'm curious what some of the some of the uh, more memorable moments of your protest were? The, in all those 10 years, I only ever had one intact man tell me he wished he had been circumcised as a child. And he changed his mind very, very quickly. Less than two minutes talking to him. My proudest moments were when people came and told me they did not cut their child because of me. And then of course, your film, which premiered at the University of Chicago Football Center. The night it premiered, two, I heard two Jewish students say they would not cut their children because of you. Not because of me, but because of you <laughs> and your film. So um, those type of things, every time I would get discouraged about being out there so long, when people came up and said that to me, that just gave me more reason to keep doing it. Because in the long run, my attitude was, Nobody at the University of Chicago, because <laughs> I was famous, I mean, I was really famous. Uh, they started putting me in the orientation material for the new students that you're going to see this <laughs> old man out there next to the bookstore, across from the hospital, and, and the, protesting about circumcision. And yeah, it's all right. You can talk to him if you want. He's, he's harmless. <laughs> and um, uh, so everybody knew about me even if they never talked to me. But everybody at the university, when they go and have a child, they're going to have to think about me. And even those who never would have agreed with me at the time, they're going to have to rethink the issue because they saw me, even if they thought I was just totally crazy. Tell me about the first time you met me. I have very like weak memories from back then, <laughs> and what you first thought of my project and the film and all that stuff. To be quite honest, you want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Nothing less will suffice, Dan. Okay. So I got a call from Greg, saying that there was this Jewish guy who had contacted them and was interested in making a film about uh, circumcision, and that he knew of my protest out at the university. 
and uh, you know he might come and talk to me. And to be honest, while there were a couple of Jewish guys in the norm group, everybody was a little bit uh, cautious about what approach you really had. And is cautious a nice word for suspicious? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And I said to them, well, you know, I'm not ashamed of what I'm doing. I'm right. <laughs> and if he, if his motives are not good, well then shame on him. And if his motives are good, well then fine, excellent. And your motives were good. So I said, no, I'm willing to do this. If, if his motives aren't good and, and this is just a, you know, a, a, a hatchet job or something, then I'll have learned a lesson. But I said, I'm not ashamed of what I'm saying. I'm not gonna say anything different than what I would say anyway. So I talked to Jewish people out on the street there at the University of Chicago. Um, so why not? So when did you realize that this wasn't a hatchet job? Um, you always seemed honest and sincere. And the time that I knew for sure it wasn't a hatchet job was when you showed us the 30 minute version that you first made for school. And I was just blown away. That was absolutely superb. And I said, this is not just a film you make for your degree at school. This has to be seen by other people. So you guys didn't know until you saw that first early cut. You had no idea what you were getting into. No. <laughs> I mean, here's this Orthodox Jewish guy. And the Jewish guys in our norm group were very, very, sus they were more suspicious of you <laughs> because they weren't Orthodox. <laughs> they were more suspicious of you than, than I was. I have to tell you, from my, my side of this experience, you guys were a breath of fresh air because I don't know if you, I don't know if I've ever told you how the original idea for the film you started. Did. So I'm just gonna tell it yeah. for, our, for our audience here. But um, I, had, uh, uh, I had a family connection to a Moho. Uh, and he had expressed interest in being a part of my film. And the film was gonna be about this embattled Moho who had been responsible for a number of botched circumcisions and was persona non grata in certain Jewish communities and in other communities he was embraced. And um, we met for the first time uh, at the University of, uh, I think it was at the Northwestern Hospitals. Mm -hmm. And I came with my camera and, and all my stuff and I was very excited to meet him and maybe shoot an interview that day. And he said to me, um, I need complete editorial control over this project if you're gonna shoot a single frame of me. And I said, you know, that's just not gonna happen. <laughs> I don't work like that. And he said, well, I've been on projects with NBC. He starts like bringing out the big, the big guns, right? To try and intimidate me, like I know better than you. And I said, they may do things that way at NBC, but my name's Eliyahu Unger Sargon and I don't work that way. And I turned on my heel and left. And at the time, I was really devastated because the whole film, and I, I had credits at stake, I was in school, it was documentary <laughs> film class, which is the whole idea for the film, I didn't know what I was gonna do. The whole film was premised on, I had access to this guy, and yeah. it was gonna be like his story of being an embattled Moab. Um, so when I met you guys, and I, as suspicious as I now knew you were, <laughs> you didn't, cautious, I, I, I like the word cautious better. We, we, we I think cautious is actually a, a more accurate term than suspicious. Cautious. Yeah. Uh, so he. So because in those days you were wearing a skull cap, not a more traditional style skull cap, but you were, you, you were clearly not a reformed Jew. <laughs> I don't think anyone has ever mistaken me for a reformed Jew. That's very true, Dan. Um, so yeah, but I, I was also impressed. I have to say, having done some more work on the subject and gotten more connected in the intactivist community, I feel very lucky to have 
stumbled upon the Chicago people because I feel like there are parts of the intactivist world where uh, things would have been a lot hairier, shall we say. <laughs> Possibly. Um, and, and that always, that I could say with a totally clear conscience to everyone I met at the time, that the people who I interviewed, who I encountered in the uh, intactivist movement were coming at it from completely pure motives, a hint of anti-Semitism, or really nice people, and just were coming at this from a very good place. That helped me a lot. Um, because I think if I had encountered uh, some of the anti-Semitism that lurks in, shall we say, some of the less savory corners of the intactivist world, it probably would have turned me off in a big way. And I, I don't know that I would have been as active going forward. Yeah. Well, I've always thought that Jews and Muslims have just been victims of this nonsense longer than Americans, you know, were. And it, it's just, we're all caught in the same trap. And it's not a matter of, of whether you're Jewish or Muslim or American or, or whether you're Coptic Christian or whether you're from a tribal group uh, that that circumcises or something like that. We're all caught in a tradition that has, should never have started in the first place. And we don't know, we haven't found a way out of it yet. So I don't look at, I don't look at Jewish people as really more guilty about this than anybody else. I, I just think of them as being victims longer than everybody else. Maybe that, maybe that doesn't sound very nice, but it, 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 it's the way I feel. It's you just got a longer tradition and burden to overcome. But it seems that even when it's a short burden, like American medical uh, nonsense, it's very difficult to overcome also. So it's, it's, we're in the same boat, and it doesn't matter to me what the original motivations were for it. We have to, we have to look at this together. It's true, and what, what you're saying resonates with me because what I've discovered in my engagement with this issue, the more I think about it, the more similar the, the, the cycle of uh, abuse is. In, in every context. And, it, and this extends, I think, to female genital cutting as well, to a certain extent, in the sense that whatever the, uh, the sort of overdetermined cultural or religious symbolism of the act is, the psychology of the people engaging in it is, is virtually identical. Mm -hmm. And that, that, to me, is very interesting. Because you'd think if someone's doing this from a religious motivation, it's different than if someone's doing it for a cultural motivation or for a medical. It's not. And the, the rationales that people give and the psychological uh, underpinnings of how this perpetuates itself is virtually identical in my, in my experience. Yeah. And I think that's uh, your, um, your framing of it as, as um, uh, how long have you been a victim, I think is, is, is nice. I think that's, that's a very good way to think about it. I've been to 75 countries around the world. Most of them I've been to at least twice. I have seen all sorts of mutilations that were done to children in the name of custom, tradition, or religion. In New Guinea, I've seen, I've been up in the Dani tribe, in, up in the Dani Valley, and Glick did his, anthropological fieldwork there. This is a culture where, in their religious beliefs, when an important man dies, in order for his soul or his spirit to rest properly, there must be pain and suffering on the part of those left behind. And they cut off the fingers of little girls. So this is what uh, a woman's hands are like as an adult. Now, the rest of the world looks at this and thinks, oh my God, this is absolutely unacceptable. This is intolerable. And uh, yet, yeah, to the people who do it, this is normal. And the women in, in that society, they tend the plants in the garden, and they have to be able to pick up a baby. And I say to people, how many fingers do you really need? <laughs> These women do just fine, at least in their culture, with this as their hands. So, 
how can we tell them that this is wrong when we're cutting our children? Most of the things that I have seen that have been done in other cultures to children are obviously seen every day. We don't see people's genitals every day. What we do is hidden away. And that's, a, I think, a huge part of our problem in trying to get rid of it. It's not something we face and see every single day. Dan, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Okay. I think we have a screening to get to. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs>